we hope that this um, this is more of a conversation. We do have some guests with us today and members of our curriculum um, team that will be sharing, but we really want to answer your questions and be able to have this, um, this time meaningful since you've made the time to be here this afternoon. So please feel free to use the chat and we'll try to answer questions in the chat, but there'll also be times throughout this presentation or this conversation, I should say, where you'll be able to um, get, you know, just unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, in addition, the structure of this is we have designed this. So the beginning part is ELA and the second part is math. So if there are more, if you were here just for one of those content areas, knowing that the first half, um, first half an hour per se, will be um, ELA and the second half will be math. So I'm joined here by uh, our, our two of our coordinators in curriculum instruction, Ebony Massey for ELA and Cassandra Bell for math, and they will introduce their teams and their guests from Eureka and EL Education when we get to their portion of the presentation. And again, I thank each of you for being here this afternoon as well. And let's get started. So our goals for today are to really highlight high level of their implementation plan, um, look, dig deeper into our curriculum. This is part two of our curriculum preview. So this, um, this is an opportunity to dig deeper into the lessons and understand how this fits into the work we've already been doing in RPS. And then how will we differentiate in order to support our English language learners and our students with disabilities, as well as having some time for Q&A. When we look at our implementation plan, um, we've divided that into three phases, and phase one being the phase we're in right now, and that is the curriculum previews that we've been having, part one last week, part two this week. Um, we're having a parent preview that's designed specifically about what parents should expect their students to come home um, learning and talking about with the new curricula, as well as having um, conversations with principals over the last two weeks around readiness and preparation um, for uh, this curriculum if it gets adopted at the board meeting on June 1st. Our second phase would begin um, pending the appro approval and adoption, I guess I should say, on June 1st would be phase two. And phase two would be a deep dive into um, professional development, which we'll show in a minute, as well as coaching training, principal trainings, um, monthly strategic meetings with our partners, and also the ordering and receiving of materials. For um, math, the virtual training looks much like this, and these are divided by roles, the roles of a principal, the role of a coach, and the role of a teacher. Um, please note that even though the principal has two that's designated for them, that they can participate, and we encourage and expect that they will be part of the learning that the coaches and the teachers will be participating in, such as focus on fluency and major work of the grade. This ELA, same thing. Um, again, the, just to be clear, the principal um, hours are ones that are designated just for them, but they will be also participating in what the coaches and the teachers are doing, including the essentials and workshops, um, and then elementary principals with the K-2 essentials and workshops. Again, both of these have opportunities for asynchronous learning as well as synchronous learning across the summer. And finally, we get into phase three. And phase three is that ongoing support. We know that um, you, we can't have all this learning. I know like as a teacher, you learn, and then you all of a sudden the school year starts and you start to apply that learning. You're like, wait, this doesn't work the same when I actually have students in front of me and I need more support now. And so um, our goal through part three is to provide that ongoing support throughout the school year, which is including professional learning, coaches trainings, cluster meetings, master classes, um, learning walks, strategic planning, et cetera. Um, so this is, and this isn't just in year one, this is continuation because that helps to build that sustainability and confidence and efficacy around um, teaching um, these standards and the curriculum. We are going to move into, and we'll go to the chat box to answer some questions, but we're going to move into the ELA block and our partners with EL Education. Um, Ebony Massey will um, kick us off. Thank you, Dr. Neighbors. How are you doing today, everyone? Um, I'd love to say um, welcome, welcome, welcome to our wonderful ELA team, Michelle Gilligan and Amar Perkins. They are here today. And if we could click over to the next slide. Okay, I want to say today, actually her name is not on the slide, but her, um, I would love to say hello to Carrie. I, I know she's here and she's going to 
present today for EL education. And I am going to actually, um, Ms. Mass, I'm going to be presenting for EL today um, oh. in Gary's stead. And that is fine. My name is Ivana McClure. I'm the Senior Professional Development Specialist for Curriculum Partnerships. Hello, everybody. We're so glad you could join us today. Hello, uh, Wanda, and welcome. Thank you for being with us today. I'm excited. Um, <laughs> so, you yeah. know, education and open up our partnering to bring their curriculum to Richmond Public Schools. Our partnership is really deeply supportive of students, teachers, and school leaders. Um, and I have a, a special affinity for Richland. Um, just so excited about uh, you guys joining our family. We recently had two other large districts join us, Detroit Public Schools and Hamilton County in Chattanooga. So I, I think you guys just round out our family really, really well. We're going to start with talking about developing the whole student. As educators ourselves, we care deeply about the standards and students' ability to meet them. And this is why our curriculum explicitly teaches and formally assesses all of the college and career standards. We also care just as deeply about how students conduct themselves as they collaborate with them, in, or whether they're working independently, collaborating with themselves as a group, or when they're faced with a challenging situation. The curriculum works to embed uh, mindsets and skills for success in college career and life within the content students are learning. Ethical people treat others well and stand up for what's right. For this reason, the curriculum focuses on students identifying and discussing characteristics of things like empathy, integrity, respect, and compassion in the characters they read about and developing those same characteristics in the work they do together. Um, finally, kids need opportunities and support to create work that's beautiful. Um, next slide. These practices are built into the curriculum to help teachers ensure that all voices are heard. Protocols, total participation techniques, engagement strategies work to make every student feel valued. Students are active learners then with um, their own agency in their own education, becoming leaders of their own learning at the earliest grades. They learn from one another and they learn to respect one another. Next slide. One of the hallmarks of our curriculum and something that teachers and students will feel a difference in right away is what we call the rethink talk write cycle. We believe that texts hold power and for that reason the curriculum requires every student to have his or her own copy of the central text in hand for much of the learning. The lessons revolve around that text and always incorporate opportunities and specific supports so that students can read the text or at least a part of it each day, think about the text using compelling and higher order questioning, talk about it with their peers, and then write about it in response to questions from the text using evidence to support their thinking. Next slide. Our curriculum is comprehensive. Um, it's a K-8 grade level curriculum. The structure of the curriculum can be understood first by exploring what's common across all the grade levels, and that are the module lessons. Module lessons live for 60 minutes daily in K-5 through five and 45 minutes daily in grades 6 through 8. They explicitly and formally assess each of the college and career ready standards for reading, writing, listening, and speaking. In addition to the one hour module lessons, at the K through two level is a second hour called the Reading Skills Foundation Block. It gives students an opportunity in a central structured phonics program to help them crack the alphabetic code. We all know that in order to become fully literate, students must acquire internalized automatic language that gives them knowledge and the building blocks around things of the spoken letter names and sounds, letter formation, the ability to break words apart, um, encode them, put them back together in spelling patterns. So it starts, we have a whole group lesson that runs for 15 minutes, and then the rest of that hour is spent in differentiated small group um, where students get instruction that's um, just right on their level. And we would love for you to see what kids say about skills block. So next slide, and let's click through that. But I know, I know you don't know what it is because you're new, but we'll tell you about it. It's made for you to learn. 
It helps your mind grow. And we have fluency, word work, writing, teacher station, air, like we um read, and then we get to move around. It's like another way to learn reading. You get to do games, fun games that that helps you that helps learning. Sometimes you do packets. The packets help you learn more. Because if you don't do the packets, it's like you're going to be a little bumpy on the road. You have a fine job, and you have different places you can go to. So, walk out and word work, and I don't know, like, some of the words. I can't interrupt Miss Morehead because she's, like, with another group. If I need, like, help, then, like, I have someone to help me. Cause like we have question people and like the leader. I like it because it makes me feel like I'm participating. I get feedback from my friends or my group members. I'm not really mad, I'm happy because if I work on it over and over again, I can get better. If they didn't do their best on the break or like they read choppy a little, then like you could like play this. I think you did me to work on like the um, not choppy, but like if they did good on the accuracy, then you could say that you did great on the accuracy. You need to improve on it so Miss Morehead will still teach you how to do it so you don't have to be that you do it the better you get of it and it's easier it gets. I used to start off so slow and choppy because I thought that word every word that I say is going to be incorrect. Now I just feel like I'm a fluent reader I can keep on going and then never stop. Until the period you will stop. Okay our um Richmond K2 small group and independent practice piece. This is just a blowout to show a comparison of the K2 small group and the independent practice um, and to do a comparison from last year to this year. So if you remember last year, a big part of our focus was on really establishing the literacy block to include whole group, small group, and independent practice. And for K2 specifically, to include that extra half an hour for um, whole group phonics instruction. Well, should we adopt the EL curriculum, there is also a very distinct structure for their um, for that two hour block of time. The first hour would be um, around module lessons, which is grade level text. And that will give students the opportunity to speak, listen, discuss, um, grammar, writing, um, et cetera. For the foundational skills block, which would be the second hour of that two hour block of time, again, um, Wanda did a really great job of explaining that there would be 15 minutes of whole group grade level material for the phonics piece. And again, it's a little bit different in that this is really the time to focus on ensuring our students know how to read, really built upon that science of reading and allowing our students to crack the code. So they would spend time um, really in a decodable reader called an engagement text, and then they would break down into the small groups differentiated instruction. And this is built on Dr. Erie's work, and so they would be broken into microphases. And based on where they assess to be placed into that microphase, then you would work forward from there. So it would be differentiated based on where students are and really helping to propel them forward. And then periodically you would have assessments to check in to make sure that students are growing. And then every day they would have an opportunity for independent practice, which would include AIR, which is accountable independent reading, fluency, word work, or, um, or writing practice. You can go to the next slide. We'll talk about three. Um, and this is the visual for um, the K2 proposed literacy block. The top is whole group instruction, and so it's around those four areas that we just discussed. And then the blue would be the second hour, which is that reading foundation skills block. And again, that top row is the whole group, and the second row would be the small group instruction, and then the final box are the different um, choices that students or experiences students would have each day throughout the week. Hopping back to grades three through five, in addition to the one hour module lessons that exist in three through five, there is a second hour called additional language and literacy or all block for short, for a second hour of content-based literacy. 
upper elementary age students uh, need more independence, they need more choice and time to achieve mastery. And that's what ALBOC is for. This component has three units parallel to three units of the module and consists of two weeks of instruction and then one week of all important flexible time that teachers can use at their own discretion to meet the needs of their students. Um, during the additional all block time, students rotate through flexible groups, groupings to practice and extend their skills, their strategies, and the content that they learn throughout the module lessons. It allows teachers to truly differentiate um, their instruction and give more support to students in practice of things like vocabulary, spelling, writing, grammar, and independent reading. Um, in terms of a description of the three, five small group and independent practice pieces that um, are changes, again, we did have the guided reading groups and we also had the independent practice. And again, in the all block, students would have that opportunity to access the grade level materials, but teachers would differentiate based on uh, where their students were and be able to provide either high support or just minimal support for those students to access. And again, they would go through those independent rotations um, during that time. And that would be where they would have opportunities to work on their um, iReady or the blended learning aspect for schools that do imagine learning, but also they would have the teacher guided activity, they would have accountable independent reading, as well as um, an independent activity on a task card. So um, that is what that would look like. And the next slide will show a visual. For those that are visual learners, again, the yellow is the whole group time and the blue would be um, a breakdown of the all blocks. So that first section, you see the teacher guided groups, the four areas that could be part of the discussion depending on what days of the week. And then for the independent um, work, the three areas that students would have to choose from for independent assignments. So now that we've talked a little bit more about what those support box look like, let's dive back into kind of an overview of the year. In every grade, K through eight, there are four modules per year. The four modules allow students to build important content knowledge on a topic related to science, social studies, or literature. Each module uses rich, authentic text throughout, includes a combination of informational text as well as literary text. Each module is eight weeks of instruction with the exception of the first module in grades K through two, which is just six weeks long in order to provide our kiddos time to establish routines um, and get classroom procedures in place at the very beginning of the year, administer baseline assessments, that kind of thing. The modules are designed to fit within each quarter of the school year, and then each module is further broken down into three units. So next slide. So take a minute and look at the topics addressed at each grade level, noting the combination of social studies, science, and literary topics. And I would just invite you to drop in the chat which one of those topics most excites you. Although the topics relate to other content areas, this is an ELA curriculum and it's designed to meet the ELA standards. Teachers still teach science and social studies to help students meet those standards. But schools that use our curriculum, um, teachers share that their students are really highly engaged in the topics when they connect them to their ELA topics. Yes, Miss Ray, I love that. Poetry and poets becoming, yes. So this slide names topics in middle school grades, and I love the middle school grade topics. We paid special attention to choosing topics that were compelling um, for adolescents and their level of development and represented diverse perspectives using text featuring diverse characters and written by diverse authors. And then it's really important to note that the assessments and the performance task are included for each module at every grade. These assessments are on demand. They're tied to the reading, writing, listening, and speaking standards. All assessments build from unit to unit, beginning with reading and research, moving to application and writing. One final note about the assessments in our curriculum is that the design and question type are developmentally appropriate and align with the question types that students typically see on high stakes end of grade testing. The culminating performance task, while not considered an assessment, 
uh, because students don't complete it independently, really addresses the high quality work dimension of student achievement and is a project that gives kids opportunity to show off all that they've learned throughout a module with feedback, revision, collaboration, and multiple drafts. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the, every module ends with a culminating performance task. Um, this is a really a high quality work dimension of student achievement that comes to life in the curriculum. Uh, throughout student, throughout module, every unit in unit three, the performance task is scaffolded. So students present, pre produce that high quality work. It shows off their literacy content knowledge. Um, and we've seen teachers do really beautiful celebrations of learning that involve all stakeholders, inviting in different grade levels, other students, parents, community members, so that all, all of the people that are a part of the school community can see and value and honor the students work in that module. Our approach to teaching and learning is grounded in respect for teachers and for school leaders as creative agents in their classrooms and in their school buildings where learning is active, it's challenging, it's meaningful, it's public, and it's collaborative. We really believe that students can be experts to do good. So we equip teachers through our lesson plans to challenge kids to take responsibility for their own learning and to share that with others, and then apply that learning to make a difference in their world. Let's look a little more deeply at the lesson plan itself. I know you're gonna get a copy of this slide deck. It's really hard to read the, the type, but I just wanna pull out a couple of the components. So really the very first thing to know is that the lesson plans are written in a way that make the, the standards very transparent. Teachers can immediately see, looking at a lesson, what are the standards I'm covering? What's the learning focus for the lesson? As well as what's the ongoing assessment formatively that I can use throughout the lesson. Each lesson consists of warm-ups, activities, summaries, and cool downs so that the flow of the lesson um, stays tight and teachers can really follow that. Next slide. The other lesson supports that we provide are that there's um, all kinds of guidance around pre-teaching, reteaching, and really meeting students with, with um, universal design learning principles. So you can, teachers have the ability to differentiate based on content and activity. Um, and there's really embedded professional development within the curriculum because it goes so deep in teacher notes about the pedagogy of why you're doing the things you're doing. Next slide. Clear guidance is given on lesson flow and activities. So you can see in the red, you can't read it because it's so tiny on your screen, but the red is um, some sample scripts of what the kinds of questions for teachers to be mindful of to ask so that we're really attending to that higher level thinking as we're asking really um, compelling questions. And the next slide gives you teachers an opportunity to plan to meet students exactly where they are. And it gives teachers that some anticipated student responses so they can really see like our students really tracking what they're learning across this lesson. And then the next slide speaks to the performance task in general. We give teachers material for additional guidance around the performance task, including ways to incorporate technology, further scaffold and challenge students as needed, and as always, um, invite family and community members to celebrate learning with students. All right, we have some Q&A and I am going to have a summary. I'm trying to watch the chat. Um, we have about five to seven minutes that we can spend now uh, specifically around ELA. So I'm gonna first kind of do, I, I'm trying to capture some of the themes I'm seeing in the chat and try to answer some of those globally. And then um, Ebony or anyone else from the ELA team if you see ones that I might miss, um, if you could like hop on and let me know um, what we need to address. So first, there were some questions around assessments. So you'll notice that a lot of those assessments in here are performance assessments, but if there are assessments that align to the curriculum that are make sense to be put in power of school, then we will do that work if that is our um, 
you know, for our assessment platform. Speaking of assessments, um, we have, this has brought, been brought up a couple times on calls that um, the number of assessments. So I know that's a different conversation, but just wanted to share that um, we are going to do, um, the goal is having curriculum adopted, but then after that is to do a hard look at what our assessments are for our school year and to really think about having a balance of that. And we plan on doing a survey and getting some teacher input about what is the right amount of assessments. And we can, especially with going into next year, I think we need to be really sensitive to the fact of what kind of trauma and experiences our students are coming into um, and how assessment will work and what is needed and what, what maybe we need to um, be balanced with. So, um, so that's something on assessment. Assessment. Regarding for um, students with um, disabilities, we are working closely with our exceptional education department. Um, students that are in the inclusive classroom will, of course, be part of this curriculum. And you saw um, some of the strategies and um, techniques that can be used to support our students with disabilities. We still will have tier two and tier three interventions. So the ones, um, every school, ha you know, we have a variety of those that happen across the school division. So those two tier two and tier three interventions are still going to be in place to support our students that um, whether they are a student with disability or students that are not maybe performing at the level, those will be there to help support our students. But this is geared to our, you know, our tier one instruction, um, our grade level instruction. Um, also, for students that may be not in an inclusive setting, we're going to be working if there are parts of this or resources in this that can help support um, the curriculum that may be already being used from that department. Again, that is something that we're still working with. And again, we want to be in partnership with their work. Um, in time frame, uh, if we can go back to the slides that show the block, there was a request to go back to the 3-5 block. There we go. Uh, that's K-2. Yep, there you go. Three. <laughs> well, this will work too. Um, looking at the three five block. So both last year, the recommendation for RPS is that K two was one hundred and fifty minutes and three five was one hundred and twenty minutes for for literacy. So we want to continue that again. We want to try to continue and stay the path. Right, and not make major changes. So this is a stay in the path. The three five block for EL education fits into our already allocated 120 minutes with an hour on the module lesson and the hour on the all block, which has that um, that small group instruction and independent practice. And if we can go back to the K-2, the K-2 we had last year, again, I said 150 minutes. The EL education part that we are adopting is the module lessons and then the, um, the skills block. And so that is two hours, but if you notice in the skills block, we have small group instruction, and we do believe the need for um, a, a focus on literacy, that, that two, um, two hours, we're really going to have two and a half hours in order to have more, more small group instruction time, making sure that we're having an opportunity to really work in the, you know work with our students and have them um, you know get to the level we want them to be reading at. And then lastly, curriculum guide, I wanted to address that. Um, of course, we'll be taking uh, this, the curriculum and placing this in our RPS curriculum guide so there's a clear understanding of the pace of, um, of the content with the, you know, you know, we have assessments and things that may be happening in RPS, so it is a clear, so we have enough time to make sure that we're using the curriculum and getting to mastery of those skills, as well as um, making sense of what units and what standards will be covered in each unit. So that's crystal clear to our teachers and our students. So now there's some more questions in the chat. Autumn, um, if I could add while you're looking so at other do. questions. Yeah. Um, one thing also the question came up about differentiating for um, L's and students with disabilities. I just wanted to point out, and it may have been addressed in the chat box, so excuse me, but those differentiation scaffolds or those scaffolds are actually in the lesson. So as teachers um, start to internalize the lesson and start to make um, decisions around how to keep the intent of the lesson, but also tailor it to meet the needs of their students, right within the lesson, it will say, if, um, if your L's have trouble with comprehension, but it will say if your L's and students that are reading below level have trouble with comprehension, then they tell you exactly what to do for that part of the lesson. And they do that throughout the entire lesson, not just on the side, not just as a call out. And that's one of the really strong pieces that are here. So just the practices that they use to teach all students um, and knowing that they've planned with that um, universal design in mind, and then also the fact that those 
scaffolds are embedded right within the lessons are some ways that we are supporting our students that are below reading level, our L's and our students with disabilities. There are also strategies in there already embedded for students that need that extra push as well. Ebony, there was questions about time to read other books. Is there nightly homework included? Um, um, and I, I know that there is the accountable independent reading. Wanda um, may want to speak a little bit more to the homework piece. Um, time to read other books. I know that there are um, there's a, a whole set of anchor texts and um, supporting texts that are there. In terms of reading other books, you, I, I'm not sure if you mean just for read alouds or if you want to do novel studies. And I don't know if there will be time it built into the curriculum for teachers to, to do novel studies, so to speak. But read alouds, there are, you, you would be able to fit that time within your daily schedule. And I can speak, this is Wanda, I can speak to the homework. So each, all the way up through eight, grade eight, there's a homework resource packet for parents that teachers have access to that explains to the parents the content students are learning as well as the standards they're working toward, gives them suggestions on independent reading plans they can be doing um, and things that they're doing in their lessons around the scope for that week. So parents can be tracking with their students, they can be supporting their students in their learning at home. Awesome, thank you, Wanda. All right, um, last question from for ELA. Um, Cassie asks, are the new pair of tech standards addressed in the lessons? Um, I would love to say yes. And they're embedded there in the lessons, not as an isolated skill or just a special experience that students need to have with paired text. The curriculum is built on the whole notion of paired text. And so again, that content building. So if they're reading fiction text, then they're also um, building background through the nonfiction or the informational text. And they're paired very naturally together. So nothing is in isolation, nothing is really separated, and they're all very much connected to each other. So students will be reading constantly texts that are paired together to help build their um, informational or their nonfiction and content background, but also reading um, fictional texts, for instance. Esperanza Rising is one of the texts that will be an anchor text, but then students will also be learning about the, um, the Declaration of Human Rights. And so that's one of those nonfiction texts, authentic pieces of, of text that students will be reading, and it will help to build their understanding of citizenship and what it means to, um, to treat people in a humane way through reading Esperanza Rising which another plug is going to be one of our read aloud summer. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to move to math. Um, so Cassandra, you want to take it away? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Neighbors. Good afternoon again, everyone. I'd like to first start by thank you all for being here today and taking time out of your busy schedules to just delve into a little bit deeper our um, potential uh, curriculum, uh, our curricula for ELA and for math. Um, first, I'd like to um, introduce my elementary specialist, um, Samara Booker, as well as Natalie Davis Waller, um, and also my secondary specialist, uh, Linda Terry and Pamela Cuther. Um, in addition, we have our wonderful partners here with Great Minds um, in Eureka Math. Jessica Trahan is the Regional Sales Director. And um, joining us this afternoon is Nadine Wolta Ali, our Implementation Specialist. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Cassandra, for that introduction. I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Nadine, and I work as part of the Implementation Success Team with Eureka. Um, and I also taught Eureka Math for six years in Washington, D.C. for grades six through eight. So if we can get, there we go. All right, so one of the things about the Eureka Math uh, Virginia edition is that it is aligned to the standards of learning for Virginia. So we're really excited about that alignment. So it really shows that this is a high quality curriculum that is aligned to those standards of learning. This edition also is aligned to the instructional shifts that is 
focus and coherence and those rigor and process goals. Um, I enjoyed the rigor of this curriculum and we'll dig a little bit deeper into that in a second. It also has one of the benefits of this curriculum is also is written by teachers for teachers. And one thing I appreciated about this is not only do students are going to get great gains out of the curriculum, teachers also express that they are better mathematicians and teachers because of the curriculum and the embedded professional development. Um, the models are still in this edition from simple to complex to support students with that conceptual understanding and the application piece addresses rigor as well also dig into how this provides both equity and access for students in those specialized populations. This is one of my favorite approaches of the curriculum is the balanced approach to rigor. And when I first started using this curriculum, I really thought that rigor meant harder and that is not the case. So with this Virginia Math Edition, we're really taking the three-prong approach to address rigor. And when we look at this tool, rigor is not just about making things harder for students. It's really having a balance of application, a balance of fluency and conceptual understanding. And if students don't have all three with equal intensity is what we notice is they're not as fluid in thinking flexibly in mathematics. And we want math to make sense for students. So with this approach, students can really be fluid in their thinking and work and understand the mathematics better. So this is the K through five, a story of units progression. And it really just shows the alignment in each module for um, up to grade five of how the Virginia Standards of Learning is aligned to the Eureka Math Virginia edition. We also have on the next slide, a checklist for the, oh, never mind. Um, so one good thing about this is also that it has the same structure as Eureka Math. So we start with that module that tells a story that students will be learning. And then from there, the module is broken down into topics. And within those topics, we find the lessons that are connected for students to study that story. Each K-5 lesson has the following four components. Each lesson is going to start with a fluency piece. And this really is going to prepare or have some type of maintenance for students with those skills. And then there's an application problem that students will engage in. Um, it requires students to utilize the concepts they've learned. Um, I've seen this done in multiple ways that, that this can be scaffolded for students. And then there's the concept development. I just think of this as that explicit instruction for the day. And this is the opportunity for students to apply their skills and understanding. And then finally, there's going to be a debrief component in the lesson as well. And this is where the teacher is going to engage in some type of conversation for students to share their thinking. So this is a visual that uh, was developed for the proposed um, K2 math uh, blog. Again, Nadine just spoke to the structures and the components of each Eureka math lesson, starting with that fluency and number sense routine to really um, support the development of fluency skills for our students. And she touched on just briefly that these fluency um, exercises can take different forms. It could be for maintenance, um, so the students can stay sharp on previously learned skills or for preparation, which is just that targeted practice for the current day's lesson, or it can even be in the format of an anticipation, um, excuse me, where skills, students are learning skills that prepare them for upcoming lessons. The application problem is an opportunity for students to engage in um, word problems, practical problems. Um, those application problems can um, occur before or after the concept development, which again is just that instructional block or the instructional focus of the block that takes up the bulk of that class period. Um, and then um, that is followed with student debrief, which I think is the most important part of the class period where students have an opportunity to engage in discourse with the teacher um, and really to articulate their understanding of concepts. This is particularly important for our um, students with disabilities or L's because they have an opportunity to articulate their understanding and the teacher has a final opportunity to redirect any misconceptions that students may have. And then finally, um, each lesson ends with an exit ticket, which is done independently and it's just a daily formative assessment 
so that teachers can assess where students are um, in their learning uh, for the lesson for that day. Um, the structure of this block is very, um, is very much the same as our structure last year, um, 75 minutes for K-2 and 90 minutes for 3-5. Um, and this is a visual, again, it's very similar um, in the approach to um, the math block, but again, the instructional period is 90 minutes. And each um, Eureka math lesson is uh, was designed to take 55 minutes. So in the uh, K-2 block, that leaves 20 minutes for students to engage in um, stations and rotations. Teachers can work on um, remediation, enrichment, intervention um, during that time. And that again leaves about 35 minutes in the 3-5 block. So when we talk about being practical and getting ready to teach a lesson, every module has a preparing to teach a lesson document. And it shows the systematic way that we recommend for teachers to prepare a lesson. We first recommend discern the plot, which is really a metaphor for reading and thinking about the story as a whole. Um, I always think about this as when I open a new book to read and we flip over the book and read that plot, this is what we're really doing. We're taking a high level view of what's gonna happen in that story and module. Then we get closer to the math and we find the ladder. This is another metaphor to thinking about that rung where students need to step on the ladder to get to that objective at the top of the lesson. So at this point, teachers are doing the math in the lesson and really thinking about their students and how those students are going to approach this lesson or where they might stumble in the lesson. Um, and finally, step three is where we're gonna select those must do's, could do's and extension problems. So every problem that is listed doesn't have to be completed in that lesson. So at that moment, teachers are really making a strategic decisions based on the standards, checklists and the outcomes of what they, what problems they're going to select for students to complete within the lesson. So when we're thinking about equity and access for diverse learners, a couple of things that I wanted to talk about how we support this equity and access. One of my favorite things about this curriculum is that it starts with that concrete learning, moving to that pictorial understanding and that abstract. I always think about when the old way of doing math, we give students like problems or procedures to learn and they really have a hard time memorizing those things. Well, with Eureka Math, they start with concrete examples to really make that math stick and they discover why the mathematics work. Once they know how the math works, we move into that abstract and procedural skills. Then they can fluidly move into those application problems. Another thing that I really like to point out about the curriculum is that academic vocabulary. Um, we are really strict, like really precise with language for students and building up that language. So students really work with the mathematics and grapple with that first. And then we attach those precise language to the mathematics so they can really make sense of it. And then the UDL boxes are within the lessons and those give options for students when you want to think of a concept or something that is happening in the lesson. They provide some alternative for students that are English language learners for students that would need another alternative for accessing that problem. Um, we can go to the next slide. And these are just a few examples of those boxes that can appear in the lesson. And they just give suggestions to teachers of how they can give choices to students. Um, so these UD UDL design principles really help students get access to the lesson. But again, we really recommend as teachers are still thinking of ways that they can customize the lesson. And I like referring back to the ladder, thinking of there might be times that you have to add something in that ladder for students to get that stepping stool to get to the top of uh, to that last rung. And then next slide. So I'll jump in. So when we think about um, Eureka, we want to make sure that teachers know that or we really want to stress that there are options for the teacher. So in each component, there are options. So you're looking at those options and you're taking in what you see in the options and what you know about your students to craft a lesson that's focused on the same lesson goal, even if it has a different pathway for, for the students in your class. So that's done by looking at the fluency options. So like someone has said already, um, they can take on three different forms. So you might see that students are 
um, skip counting forwards and backwards by three in preparation for a lesson that's going to be focused on multiplication in division of three. Um, you might see that students might be subitizing with five group dot cards um, in preparation of representing addition problems. Um, the same thing happens in the application problems. They don't always have to be presented right before the concept development. In most situations, again, the teacher's going to have to read through that lesson and make a decision for her class as to where she's going to present um, that application problem. And I'd like to just add for the application problems. Um, we recently looked at one of the modules um, and saw that it was 20 lessons long. And we just wanted to kind of test if the application problems really addressed all of those problem types that are spelled out in our um, curriculum, uh, curriculum framework, I'm sorry. And what we found is in those 20 lessons, there were six to seven different problem types that were addressed in that five to, ten, that five to eight minutes each day. Um, and so we know that historically, unintentionally, teachers tend to teach that results unknown problem for most of the time. And we found that using that application problem, just doing the graphics on it, you see that we're covering what we need to cover in our curriculum framework. Um, and again, those application problems can be before the concept development, after the concept development, and a lot of times they're used to bridge lessons. Um, in the concept development, this is where new content is delivered. This is new instruction. And it, can't be done effectively if a teacher doesn't know their students. Um, so this is where teachers are really gonna employ their knowledge of their students and make some de instructional decisions for what is gonna happen for the bulk of that lesson. So they read the lesson, they work through the instructional problems, the teachers do, um, and you consider the students and the lesson's goal and you make decisions on how you're gonna deliver those that lesson for the day. Um, and I've seen some teachers do some beautiful um, things with the lessons and how they uh, deliver that instruction, whether it's whole group, whether it's small group rotations, you know, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, um, or whether it's a hybrid. So I, I find an instructional problem that I want to teach the whole class. And then I look at the other problems and I say, hey, I know I have a group of five who need this lesson because this question because they're ready for it. I have an, another group of five who really need me to support them and scaffold for them. And so they need to, you know, have this problem. And so there, because there's a ladder in the concept development, that's easy for the teacher to differentiate for all of the needs in her class. I'm um, and again, whole group, small group, or a hybrid. Um, and I'd also like to share that the scaffolds are built into the lesson plan. OK, so they have those UDL boxes that help you meet the needs of your English language learners, your students who m might have disabilities, um, students who just need a little bit of support with vocabulary, students who might need visual cues. All of those things are spelled out in the lesson where they should take place. Um, and then the, for the student debrief, and like Cassandra said, this is one of my favorite parts because it's a whole class discussion. So it gives the teacher the opportunity to um, just facilitate a discussion on the learning for that day. And it's a good time for, for the teacher to grab some data on just how students are communicating about what they've learned that day, how they engage with the lesson, and it informs the instructional moves that the teacher is going to make for the next lesson. Um, and again, it's presented as a menu of options of discussion starters or probing questions. And the, again, the teacher makes those decisions. Next slide. So this is just a sample lesson of the Virginia edition Eureka Math. And the first thing that you're going to see is going to start with the lesson component with it's going to state the objective explicitly. And then from there, it's going to point out that all lesson components will be in the lesson starting with the fluency, application problem, concept development, and student debrief. And all of those components will be in each lesson to address those components of rigor as well. And then on the next slide is the concept development. And this has a few notes in here that shows um, the adoption for the Virginia edition, where things were modified to make sure that all the standards of learning are addressed in the curriculum. And one thing about the concept development is, yes, it has a dialogue in here for teachers, but again, this should be customized to meet the needs of your students. So this dialogue is not a script, 
but we want to make sure we keep that integrity of the lesson to meet the objective as stated. And then there will be a problem set and student debrief. We have a component of the exit ticket and homework as well. And again, this has been adopted for the Virginia edition. Um, so we also have some support. I know it's okay. <laughs> we also have some resources that we have online to help support teachers. And one of my favorite resources that I really like to use was the Math Night resources because it has templates already there that was created that we can that can share with the community members and parents that had questions. And I just really feel like we don't have to recreate things that were already there. I also enjoyed the online community um, because there a lot of teachers were sharing things that they were doing in the classroom and really ways that they brought the lessons to life um, after they customized the lessons. And that was a great way to communicate with others in the community. And then we're running back. Yep, there we go. Thank you. So we'll answer a few questions. Thank you. We have just a few minutes. Um, to answer some questions and in the chat box. And I think we've hopefully answered a number of them, but let's make sure we've hit them all. Um, there's, you all have asked amazing questions. So let me go back to the top of math. Um, so the questions, first of all, there's questions around alignment. So, um, and then, you know, is this Richmond math? And so just remembering the journey from a small group of schools, eight schools that started with Eureka Math, that was the initial pilot. And that pilot had was a partnership with Eureka. Last year, we were hoping to adopt a curriculum. Um, we were not able to adopt a curriculum um, per our MOU or moving forward, but we did get permission to extend that pilot. But it, the extended pilot had to show alignment. And because we did not have a adopted curriculum, we didn't have the contract to contract with the company. So that was all on our department um, or, or all on RPS, which fell a lot in um, curriculum instruction, but that was, you know, shared across the division. And, um, and with that, the alignment work began. So if you think about this um, Eureka Math, you think of this as like the next iteration. Yeah, I think of our, our iPhones and like your iOS and how you have the next iteration. This has taken all the great work we found in year one with Eureka Math and, you know, the story of math that the, the curriculum is built from. And then the alignment work we began last year, this is going to ensure and tighten up all that alignment work, get it, have it produced. Um, and so it's going to be printed and then available digitally on the Eureka platform and have that. So if you've been using Richmond Math, this is the, um, you know, it's the next level. It's the improved version. Um, and so we are going to, it's going to be checked for alignment. And as the dean said, those, um, those lessons are embedded um, within the units. And so I believe like each grade level has an additional 30 lessons um, that are making sure that we're attending to all the essential skills and knowledge that are part of our SOLs. And Cassandra or Samara on the call, if you want to add to that, if there's something that um, you think would be helpful to elaborate on, um, feel free to do so. No, I think you covered it well, Autumn. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm always like, you know, that, that's the, the math team there so uh and i know they've been on this journey uh if we don't return in the fall in the physical classroom how will this look and this is i think that's a great question for both curricula um because that is something that we want to make sure we're building in so the professional learning as we talked about the implementation plan earlier in in this presentation is going to be delivered to the professional learning for us as teachers as educators is virtually and part of that is then how do we teach this curriculum virtually. So we want to make sure that our professional learning attends to that in order to prepare for um, whatever situation we're coming back to, whether that's virtual, whether that's in person or, you know, or it's blended in some form or fashion. So this will help build those skills while uh, learning the curriculum. So I think it's, um, you know, our goal is that it would be a win-win. Lesson plan expectations. So there are, um, we, we believe that it's so important for teachers to really spend that time to unpack lessons, the intellectual 
work that is part of preparation and planning. So that part, the lesson planning will occur. The expectations for that, we're gonna be doing some um, specific training on what that looks like with both the Eureka curriculum and the EL curriculum. How do we take that and what will the expectations be? So we're clear on that. Um, in your question here, it says it's varied in the past year and changed many times throughout the year, being, you know, writing annotations and lesson plan. And I think that was that was our the part of learning, right? What what worked? We had an internalization document, which can work well, but the purpose of that internalization document is to really get into the intellectual prep needed for the lesson. Um, what we found is some principals and some schools found that the annotations in the lessons were the had the same effect. Um, and so we will though with the, the curriculum make sure that we have clear expectations what lesson planning looks like so we can make sure and then as a teacher um, our goal is to make, meet those expectations right and we want to do that and we want to meet what our kids our kiddos need too. Um, so we're going to make sure that that is very clear. Um, when will we know if the curriculum has been adopted and when will the training begin? So this is goes to the school board on June 1st, which is Monday. And um, if adopted at that meeting, our plan is to order. Um, we have, you know, order documents on, you know, ready to go that we will start ordering the materials needed for the ELA. Um, excuse me, the ELA curriculum, we know we want to order those books and the um, teacher guides as soon as possible as well as with math. But knowing that there's extra text with the EL, um, as well as the training. Uh, we're working on our training plan that will begin in June as well. So our goal is the sooner adopted, the sooner we can get those materials to our teachers so they'll have that time to really internalize the curriculum and be able to spend the time, which we hear from a lot of our teachers. We, we don't wanna learn it right before August. We wanna have the time to process it and really think about it and, you know, and do that curriculum justice and do well for our students. And we wanna be able to provide that for our teachers. That's so important. I think, Ebony, I think I heard you trying to come on, so um, I don't want to um, talk too much if you want to, you all want to add something. And Susan, I agree. We don't want to spend, we don't want teachers to spend their time cutting and pasting from a lesson plan to another lesson plan. That's not a good use of the, the brain power of our teachers. Um, and Autumn, the only thing I yeah. wanted to add was that we are also looking at um, being able to provide that text digitally for students um, oh, yes. if we are in a virtual um, situation when, stu when students, when we go back to school. Yes, good point. I don't, I think we've handled all the questions, but if we didn't, if somehow we missed them, because there's a ton of great questions and we've been trying to answer them, whether in the chat or um, in, in, you know, right now aloud. But if we miss something, feel free to reach out. We're gonna have this recording again, post this. We're gonna capture the comments. I think um, either Cassandra or Ebony have someone from their team that will capture these comments to make sure we can add this into our FAQ, which will be on our website. And again, our website is RBA schools backslash curriculum hyphen adoption. And, um, and thank you for your time. And if you need anything, feel free to reach out to us. We are here to support. Have a great day.